you look at the data, almost one out of every two people that you pass on the street in America are trying to survive on six hours of sleep or less during the week, um, and which is stunning. And, and by the way, I should say that based on the studies, the number of people who can survive on six hours of sleep or less um, without showing any impairment in their brain or their body, rounded to a whole number and expressed as a percent of the population is zero. In truth, there is no major physiological system in your body or operation of your mind that isn't wonderfully enhanced when you get sleep or demonstrably impaired when you don't get enough. There is a global experiment that is performed on 1.6 billion people across 75 countries twice a year. And it's called daylight savings time. <laughs> now, in the spring, when we lose just one hour of sleep opportunity, we've observed a 24% relative increase in heart attacks the following day. Now, in the fall, in the autumn, when you gain an hour of sleep, there is a 21% reduction in heart attacks. So it's bi-directional. If you take a human being and you deprive them either of sleep for just one night or you selectively deprive them of just deep sleep for one night, the next day we can see an immediate increase in the amount of Alzheimer's disease protein, this is uh, amyloid protein and tau protein, the sort of these sticky toxic proteins that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. If a lack of sleep increases your Alzheimer's disease pathology in the brain and Alzheimer's disease risk, then flip that logic around. What is it about sleep when you do get it that de-risks your Alzheimer's disease probability? A scientist called Macon Nedegaard at the University of Rochester. And studying mice, what she found, firstly, is that your brain has a sewage system. It's called the glymphatic system, named after the cells that make it up in your brain called the glial cells. If that wasn't remarkable enough, she made two more discoveries. The first is that that sewage system in the brain isn't always switched on in high flow volume during the 24 hour period. It was only when you sleep that that sewage system kicked into high gear. The final part then she discovered, which brings it back around to Alzheimer's disease, was that two of the pieces of metabolic detritus that this sleep cleansing system was washing away every night was beta amyloid, and tau protein, both related to Alzheimer's disease. Every night, you're not getting that cleansing of the brain, and it becomes like compounding interest on a loan. Night after night, you're not clearing that Alzheimer's protein, set of, set of proteins, and it just builds up and builds up. Now, it's going to take years before it starts to have an effect, but it will have an effect. Sleep is a missing piece in the explanatory puzzle of aging and Alzheimer's disease is exciting because sleep is a modifiable factor. What three things would you love every single person here to go away with to make sure they do for their sleep? I think the probably the three maybe most impactful things that you could think about is the first is regularity. If I could give you one piece of advice to try to keep your sleep straight, it's regularity. Go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time. No matter whether it's the weekday or the weekend, regularity is king. The second thing is be mindful of alcohol. Alcohol is in a class of drugs that we call the sedatives. And sedation is not sleep. The second problem with alcohol is that it fragments your sleep. So you're going to wake up many more times throughout the night. The third issue with alcohol is that it is one of the most potent suppressors of REM sleep that we know. The third thing is caffeine. Caffeine, um, there are three things with caffeine too that may surprise you. The first is its duration of action. Caffeine has what we call a half-life of about five to six hours. In other words, after about five to six hours, 50% of that caffeine is still in your system. The second issue with caffeine, is, of course, is that it makes it harder for you to fall asleep. And also caffeine is what we call an anxiogenic. Caffeine will increase your anxiety where you're lying in bed and all of a sudden you start thinking. You start thinking about what didn't I do? What do I need to do? 
you start ruminating. And when you start ruminating, you start catastrophizing. And after you start catastrophizing when your head is on the pillow, you're dead in the water for the next two hours. Some people can say to me, look, I can have two espressos with dinner and I fall asleep fine and I stay asleep. So no harm, no foul. Even if that's true, that caffeine will decrease the amount of deep sleep that you get. And we've done some studies where we give you a standard cup of coffee, let's say a strong drip brew cup of coffee, about 200 milligrams of caffeine. It will drop your deep sleep by about uh, somewhere between 15 to 20% at night. Now, for me to drop your deep sleep by 20%, I would have to age you by about 12 years. Or you could just do it every night with a cup of coffee.